Great. Uh, thanks so much. And I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some uh, recent research that I've been doing trying to bring together machine learning and causal inference in uh, the context of economics and social science problems. And I came to all of this as I was working at Microsoft. Um, I got invited uh, to help Microsoft uh, work on Bing Ads and the Bing search engine and how to compete with Google back in 2007, 2008. And I was invited in because of my experience with designing auction-based marketplaces. And I'll give you a little taste of some of that research in a minute. Um, and so when I came in, the, I was sort of the only economist and sort of a sea of people trained in other disciplines, a lot of computer science, engineering, and so on. And of course, at the beginning, I was thinking about market design and the economic issues, but it became very clear very quickly that the way that I thought about data and statistics was very different from the way that all of these other folks did. And so for a couple of years, I, we argued and talked across purposes. Um, and you know, it took me a while to really become bilingual, but I needed to if I wanted to get anything done with data because I was working with teams. And you know, so I needed to speak their language if I wanted to accomplish anything. But over time, I also began to know enough to see where I thought there were interesting gaps. So I'm going to talk today about, first of all, a little bit of the history of how, I came, how an economist would be thinking about some of these problems um, before trying to bring it together with big data, and then um, highlight some of the things that I think are interesting open research going forward. So let me start out with some like really broad stereotypes. And I should say right away that um, I never give these stereotypes without offending people. The, the exceptions to some of the stereotypes or some of the leading lights of that are all sitting in this room. Uh, for example, a lot of the people at Microsoft Research uh, and uh, Leon Batu, who was at Microsoft and then Facebook and so on. But nonetheless, I'm in this kind of stereotype about like the, 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 how I think about like the middle of the, a lot of these fields. So um, supervised machine learning, when I think about how it differs from, say, what a social scientist, particularly I think econometricians are some of the most um, kind of methodologically oriented social scientists. So how those two groups think differently about problems and the parts of statistics that are, of course, statistics kind of splits. Uh, so parts of statistics are more machine learning and parts are more kind of like, think like social sciences. But some of the things that I noted that were, that were really like vastly superior in from the machine learning side that I thought could really be imported into the, the traditional social science uh, methodology were just these very well-developed non-parametric models that um, had a very um, good approaches for working with big data and also really systematic data-driven model selection. And so particularly the fact that you, how you use the data to select your model is something that, believe it or not, like in social sciences, that was typically viewed as a very bad thing. So until just like two or three years ago, if you said data mining in economics, that was an insult. Um, that was like what, you know, that was sort of, now, now people realize that you should use that, that's a new hot thing, data mining is good. But the idea of data mining, that you were like fishing at your data to find your model, was um, that's sort of like p-value hacking. This was bad because God was supposed to have given you your model and you were supposed to have a theory about how the world worked and you weren't actually supposed to be peeking at the data to figure that out. And so that kind of religious view from, from that part of the literature, you, you can kind of help understand why even today there's like some resistance of bringing in new techniques um, in that perspective. Um, and so, of course, what we know, one of the really interesting things about how science progresses, like if a science has a very clear set of objectives, um, it can progress very quickly. So if you think about supervised machine learning and how you can sort of test one model against another using data, that gives a very clear way for science to progress. I can have model A and model B, and we don't have to philosophize, and we don't have to argue, and we'd, we don't have to theorize. We can just say, all right, we'll hold out a test set, and whichever one wins is the better model. And so with that sort of clear kind of benchmark, you know, we've, there's just been this massive progress in the dimension of, of predicting. So you know, it took a little while for me to sometimes convince machine learning colleagues that, who kind of were very, very entrenched in that way of thinking that there were some questions that that didn't answer very well. 
So as an example, I'd say, well, what happens if you wanted to change from the generalized second price auction to the Vickery auction in Bing Ads? And they say, well, you know, I can, I, maybe I just need a more complicated machine learning model. And I'd say, no, 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 like that's, that's wrong. And so finally, kind of the way we were able to sort of um, formally come to agreement about what the issue is, is that essentially the joint distribution of X's and Y's is going to fundamentally change if you move to a Vickery auction. Like, so the, the key assumption of you know, supervised machine learning in the standard context is that you have this joint distribution of X and Y's and you're going to predict well in a test set which also has the same joint distribution of X and Y's. Most of what economists are interested in doing is answering questions about what happens when you manipulate the world and that joint distribution is going to change. So a classic thing would be, okay, Staples and Office Depot want to merge. We want to, when they merge, firms will behave differently. They're, the relationship between, say, city characteristics and prices will change. And so there's really nothing in today's data that directly predicts without additional assumptions how they will strategically change once, um, once they merge. So those types of counterfactuals are kind of harder counterfactuals, and you're not going to get there just directly with observing a, a, a stochastic process without additional assumptions. So the, 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 a lot of the, the, the literature, and some, if, you, if you kind of naively say if you take the basic class at Stanford on machine learning, you would never learn even a language for articulating that issue, or, nor would you be exposed to the, the most commonly used econometric techniques for answering those kinds of problems. Of course, you might, in fact, you know, I, people argue with me and say, what, you're telling me you're going to make that kind of prediction? That's not science, that's pseudoscience. You know, like, are you telling me an entire discipline tries to answer those kinds of questions? Like, you just must be, you know, charlatans because the data couldn't possibly answer those questions for you. And so, in some sense, what you can think of, you know, a couple of decades of, of economic empirical work has tried to figure out what kinds of assumptions would allow you to make predictions about what happens when the world fundamentally changes, a lot of arguments about which assumptions are better, which ones are worse, you always are going to need additional assumptions. And so there, and there's actually a lot of subtlety to that, but there's also a lot of accumulated knowledge about how to do that. And so that, that aspect was, is sort of what's not taught in any of, say, the basic courses at Stanford outside of, say, the economics department. Um, if you took the basic machine learning courses, you wouldn't, wouldn't encounter that. Um, of course, within the machine learning is a huge field. Um, people like Pearl, Leon Batu, the uh, John Langford, um, it, people have, have thought about causality within this context, but it's not sort of necessarily a required component of, of education. One other exceptional group, I would say, to any stereotypes are Bayesians. So Bayesians kind of, that's like a religion that seems to transcend discipline. Uh, so all Bayesians speak Bayesian, and I think one interesting thing about that, from again, from sociology of science perspective, is just that partly, like, when you're Bayesian, you need to write down a model, and when you need to write down a model, you need to think about what your data generating process is, and so you tend to think harder about assumptions and the way the world works, but just because you had to write down the model. So that, in some sense, creates a commonality, even if it's sort of an accidental one uh, across disciplines. Um, okay, so what, you know, on the econometric side, we, we tend to always have a formal theory of causality. Um, I'm going to talk about, the, put some stuff in the, the context of the potential outcomes model of Rubin. Um, generally, the, we, we're going to make some kind of model that's going to predict what would happen when the world changes. So the simplest example is I ran a randomized controlled trial, and I'm trying to make a prediction about what would happen if I gave everybody the treatment. Um, but, you know, more, more broadly, um, we could think about, again, what happens as a result of a merger or changing an auction. So it, we also are very commonly using observational data, um, but trying to use it to make causal inference. Um, so for example, we might want to uh, look out at data about prices and quantities and make a prediction about what happens if you change price. That's a thing that a lot of firms hire economists to do. Um, you might notice in the data, suppose you did that for hotels, if you went out and got data on prices and quantities in hotels, you would almost always find that prices and quantities are positively correlated. Um, generally when demand is high, prices are high. Um, so any model that just tried to fit the y's and x's together would necessarily tell you a great thing to do if you tried to give it a causal interpretation is you should raise prices, that'll help you sell more hotel rooms. 
Of course, that's not a good recommendation, and, but because almost all economic data sets kind of have that flavor of where they just patently give you an incredibly stupid answer if you don't deal with causal inference, we've from, the, from day one sort of had to think about how to use the data differently. So an example of how you might try to do this is you would use something called an instrumental variable, which might be something that shifts the cost of hotel rooms or you know, something, something that's going to shift, uh, that's going to cause the prices to change that's unrelated to demand. And so you might end up throwing away most of the price variation that's in your data and only focusing on a small amount of it that's sort of clean or experimental-like variation to, to drive, drive your estimates. Then at least you get the demand curve sloping the right way and can give reasonable advice. So that's, you know, what we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and so, of course, some big weaknesses here, um, first of all, you're always making assumptions, and so there's a lot of time arguing about assumptions, and there's often no ground truth to know. So, you know, in the St Staples Office Deed Pro merger, we're going to have two experts paid, you know, over $1,000 an hour each. One is going to say the curve slope is like this, the other one's going to say the curve slope is like that. There is not a ground truth. We don't know what the curve looks like, the demand curve looks like, actually, and so they just have to fight it out which is kind of deeply unsatisfying, but on the other hand, they're gonna decide, right? They're either gonna merge or not merge, and would you rather make it with no data or with some data? So that's the kind of world we live in. We're generally, beyond the issue of just untestability and no ground truth, um, we're generally gonna not be very good at flexible not models. Um, Non-parametric methods tend, tend to fail um, with more than a few covariates because we've tended to use things like kernels because of their statistical properties. And the model selection is generally incredibly unprincipled. So because we're not allowed to use a, 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 an algorithm for our model selection, we pretend that it was given by God, but then actually in the background we check 100 versions of it and then how God knows how you actually interpret the results or which five things I show you out of the 100 that I tried. So it's really kind of a, you, pretend, you, you have to pretend to be doing something you're not doing, which leads to a lot of problems and unreplicability of research and all of that stuff. So into this like kind of broad theme then, you can hopefully see where I see some of the connections coming in. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement on the, the econometric side, importing from machine learning, but there's also a few things that we've been focused on that haven't been the, the, the primary focus of machine learning and bringing these things together, I think there's gonna be a lot of fertile ground. And ultimately, you know, some of the people are, are that we in our universities are going to go off and work on deep inventing new algorithms for Bing, but others are going to be in roles where they're going to be asked questions like, did the advertising work? Um, should we enter this market? And for those types of questions, actually, you need a little bit of this other types of methodology. Okay. So within econometrics, there's actually um, two different kind of paradigms, which ultimately were, were kind of at war over a period of time, uh, but from 50,000 feet will look very similar, but I'm just gonna introduce you to those, uh, even though they are very close together from the perspective of supervised machine learning. That is, almost all of economics is looking for counterfactuals, but there's actually a lot of debate about how many assumptions you should make to get your counterfactuals. So one branch of it focuses mainly on statistical assumptions. So things like uh, conditional independence assumptions. I would say, okay, I saw a cost shock that caused a firm to change their price, and I know that that was why they changed their price and not because they were responding to demand. So there's an independence assumption between the cost shock and consumer preferences or holidays. That kind of independence assumption is a statistical assumption, I would call it. But then there's a second kind of question, which is, gee, how much will consumer welfare change if these two firms merge? Consumer welfare, well, that's unobservable, right? Like, how would I know what your welfare is? I've got to put a dollar value on how much worse off you are as a result of a merger. If I want to go from data to welfare, how well off you are or how profitable a firm is, I need to draw inferences about your utility or a firm's unobserved profits. And in order to draw those kinds of inferences, you need to make behavioral assumptions. And so there's often a lot of debate about whether you want to assume consumers are maximizing utility, whether firms are maximizing profits. If you make those additional assumptions, you're going to be able to make much stronger predictions, but those assumptions may or may not be true. Okay? So I'm going to start out by showing you kind of what a model would look like that had some experimental variation as well as some behavioral assumptions. Um, 
and give you a sense of how we would use those. And then I'll move on to the, the kind of heart of the talk is about some papers I've been writing that only relies on statistical assumptions or randomization and not behavioral assumptions. So to start with, this is some work that I was doing before I got involved uh, with Microsoft. And so this was a case where we were trying to use data to evaluate alternative market designs for timber auctions. And so one question is, do you want to use an open ascending auction, where the game is that people keep raising each other's bids until, the, until everybody drops out but one? And also, another policy is, do you want to have small business set-aside auctions, where only small bidders can enter? And both of these were things that were un under consideration by the Forest Service of the US over many years. And so there was actually a randomized field experiment in the 1980s, where they actually drove balls from an urn to decide which kind of auction to run. Um, to choose which, and, and that's one data set that I have. Um, in another case was how you decided which auctions were going to be set aside. Well, what they did there was they had a, like a volume cutoff for how big they could be and then randomized uh, within that group as to what was going to be set aside. So, um, and it, it, it wasn't perfect randomization, so there's some stuff going on in the background here, but that's not my, uh, I won't emphasize that today. So. The first thing you can do, just based on statistical assumptions, is try to understand what is the causal effect of having a, a first price sealed bid auction, where you mail in your bids and the highest bidder pays their bid, and this open ascending auction, which is basically like a second price auction. What is the effect, the causal effect of that on outcomes? And so we looked at some outcomes. There's small bidders and bidders and big bidders. So loggers are small bidders. Um, and so we, we saw, for example, that um, there's roughly a 10% increase in the number of small bidders entering an auction when you run a first price auction. So the causal effect of running a first price auction is that a lot more small bidders show up. Um, there's also a 4% increase in the, the chance a logger wins, and there was roughly 10% more revenue. Okay? So you can just get that because I had a randomized experiment, or almost as good as a randomized experiment, I'm able to estimate those causal effects. In terms of small bidding set-asides, relative to ones where both small and big bidders could come, we would get about 8% more small bidders showing up at these small bid auctions. So this is a causal effect. And I could think, well, gosh, if I, if I did everything as, as first price auction, I would expect this different kinds of patterns. But I can't assess whether these magnitudes are actually consistent with theory. Economic theory qualitatively predicts stuff like this. But quantitatively, I don't know whether the theory is, could account for this. And I also can't tell anything about efficiency or revenue trade-offs from this. So for, for trying to make stronger statements, like you know, what would happen to profits or welfare, I'm going to need some behavioral assumptions. And so the way that I work here is I'm going to, I'm going to, I didn't, I'm going to estimate all the primitives of a model using one market design and a behavioral assumption. So I'm going to take first price sealed bid auctions, because it turns out actually you, you, there's a theorem that says with the open ascending auction, you actually can't learn everything you need to know to do these exercises. But with first price sealed bid auctions, you can. Um, and so with the first price sealed bid auctions, I'm going to estimate what everybody's values are. And then I'm going to predict how many people will show up at these other kinds of auctions, how will they bid, and, and what, what should happen. And then I can see whether I did a good job fitting out of sample. If I did, then I have my models more credible, and maybe you would believe my welfare um, numbers. And then I could maybe do some other counterfactuals about things that did never happened at all. So I have to, first of all, figure out what are my primitives. So I need to estimate value distributions for large and small bidders. I, there's also a distribution of a latent variable, an unobserved auction characteristic that I can't see. I can learn about that because I see lots of bids in the same auction. And that's how I learn about the unobserved shock. Um, the reason I can't do a second price auction, there's essentially a missing bid. I never see the first, the highest size willingness to pay. And since I'm missing an order statistic, I can't uncover the latent variable. But in the first price auctions, I can. I also need to figure out what the entry costs are. So how could I possibly know how much it costs a bidder to enter this auction? Well, if I can figure out their profits from the auction, I and I impose a zero profit condition, I can say, well, gosh, if their entry costs were, um, were lower than another bidder should have entered the auction. If their entry costs were higher, not so many bidders should have come. So from seeing how many come, I can infer what their, 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 um, their entry costs are. And so then if I can figure out those things, I can then um, make predictions. So 
essentially just seeing, like to kind of put this a little more visually, uh, I'm going to estimate the yellow, the first price auction with unrestricted participation, and then I'm going to predict what would happen if I run a set-aside auction or what would happen if I do an ascending auction. So here's just a, a little bit of a summary of, of what we did. So in this first column are the actual auctions for unrestricted sales and set-asides. And these are slightly different characteristics, so they're kind of different distributions. So I th need to think about sort of reweighting uh, my model if I estimate here and predict onto here. And I'll just do that using the distribution of characteristics, of auction characteristics in this population. Then um, I'm going to estimate a model, and then I can sort of think, well, in, I estimated data on unrestricted sales, so then I'm going to make predictions. My model will just predict back, and I can see how well my model fits the same data I estimated on. And because I've got functional form restrictions, it's not going to fit perfectly, but it's going to fit pretty well the characteristics of the auctions I estimated on. And then I can say, well, and so these, these are like sort of how well I fit, and if it's one, I fit perfectly. So I, I fit pretty well, but not perfectly in sample. Then the question is now, I'm going to try to predict what would happen if I ran a set-aside auction using a model that was only estimated on unrestricted auctions. And so if I, my model is going to tell me that 4.7 small bidders should show up if it's a set-aside auction, well, my model is going to predict that only 2.6 small bidders will show up if it's an open ascending auction. So it's a really different game with a really different number of bidders. But only using data where the average number of bidders is, is in the twos, I was able to predict this very large increase in entry. Okay? So that's, kind of a, that's the kind of counterfactual we would like to do. We don't want to predict something necessarily that's completely close to what happened, but I want to predict what happens in a change of the game. And the theory tells you the, re the reason this is happening, if you're curious, is that in an open ascending auction, the strongest bidder always wins. So if a, if, a, if a big guy shows up and he typically has a higher value, a smaller bid has, is just going to get outbid and they're going to go home and have wasted their time. But in a first price sealed bid auction, you shade your bids and the, the, the strongest bidder will, will bid a gap between their bid and their payment and so they'll leave this hole where somebody who values it less than the strongest bidder can sneak in and win the auction. So they have some chance of winning and so that suggests that they, more of them should show up. So, you know, and of course I'm not perfect here, I'm, I'm, I'm off by 5%, but I'm, it's still, a, I'm, I'm predicting really far out of sample. Okay. And so part of the whole, um, a few kind of things to note out of this. First of all, this paper actually was published well and it got a lot of attention, partly because I was doing a counter, I actually did this exercise, I did a counterfactual and I actually had the data. There aren't that many data sets like this where you, you actually have both at the same time. So most economics papers would do this exercise, but they would have no idea if they were in the right ballpark with their predictions. So this was nice because I validated my model. On the other hand, everybody I know in machine learning is like, are you nuts? Like, how could you possibly make a prediction without validating your model, right? I mean, how could you stand up in a courtroom and say these two firms shouldn't merge if you didn't, if you hadn't had an, an experiment like this where you could see if your model actually made those kinds of predictions. And people have done retrospective studies and things like that, but I just say that you can publish very well in economics without doing this kind of validation. And so that's, in some sense, maybe we're unscientific, but that's kind of the state of the art because we're very used to being in worlds where we have to make predictions very far away from the world we live in. Okay. Um, all right. So that's kind of the, the sort of a, st a structural approach and maybe it gives you a little bit of a sense of you know, where I was coming from when I came into machine learning and why it felt so then very unfamiliar to be thinking about just using X's to predict Y's um, because that's not what people were usually asking me to do. Um, so now I'm going to move though to a simpler model for, for, the, for um, the rest of the talk one where my counterfactual is going to be a much simpler kind of counterfactual. I'm going to be thinking about a binary treatment. Should I ship an algorithm or not for being ads? Should I give a drug or not? Um, should I raise the minimum wage or not? So just 0, 1. And so W equals 1 if, if you get a treatment and W equals 0 if you don't. And I'm going to use potential outcomes notation. And what this is going to mean is this conceptually for every one of you, you have some possible outcome if you get a drug and there's some possible outcome if you don't get a drug. Okay, and it's going to be very important to think about it that way um, because it, I have to think about it that way if I want to think about a counterfactual. So I, I, if I'm going to imagine giving everybody in this room a drug 
but my experiment data has only half of you getting the drug. I, the object I'm interested in is what would happen if the other half of you got the drug, but I didn't see you in that circumstance. So this is, Holland called this the fundamental problem of causal inference. We don't see the same units at the same time with different counterfactual values of, of, of the treatment. And so in some sense, this makes it clear why you need some assumptions to do anything in causal inference. Because if you think of it that way, like there's sort of a missing data problem. And I saw you with aspirin without some assumption. Uh, I have no idea what would happen to you without the aspirin. I, without some assumption, you could die from aspirin, right? The, I would need some assumption. And of course, randomization is a really simple assumption. It just says that you're sort of like these other people. And so I can infer something about you from what happened to these other people. But that is an assumption. Um, it's just one that's very naturally satisfied in an experiment. A second thing is that we're going to think of units of study typically having fixed attributes x that, that wouldn't change with alternative policies. So we don't imagine moving coastal states inland when we change the minimum wage policy. We think of the, the, the attributes of consumers on Amazon as having kind of characteristics that aren't really changed by the treatment. It, um, actually, historically, econometrics didn't do a great job of distinguishing between causal variables and x's. But that's going to be one of the things that also I want to bring into machine learning. We usually think about just using a bunch of people to predict why, and we don't kind of treat some of them one way and some of them another way. And I want to argue, no, you do. You want to treat some of the variables differently than others. So the application, and this I think is like really this like the very obvious first place to marry in these two traditions, is the problem of heterogeneous treatment effects. So I want to, you know, at Bing, we have these, the, these major algorithms that do all of this personalization. Then they get, they get judged in a randomized controlled trial where the algorithm as a whole is judged on, say, 1% of users in a treatment group, 1% of users in a control group. And then we say, if it looks good, we release it to everyone. But that's kind of crazy when you think about it, because any particular algorithm is going to work better for some queries than others, for some people than others. And so what we would really like to know is, well, for whom should we trigger this algorithm and for whom should we not? But even in these very fancy, very sophisticated machine learning organizations, they don't actually systematically do that. Instead, if, you know, you, if your algorithm flunks, you might go back and retune it offline and look at the data and do some other things and then bring it back and it would have to go through another experiment. But you don't typically actually look at the heterogeneous effects um, in the standard evaluation of an algorithm which is kind of schizophrenic if you think about it, um, but, but, but it, it is schizophrenic. Um, another thing is the, the effect of a drug. So if you, uh, if, you do, if you do a clinical trial, you have to have a pretreatment plan that says, how am I going to break up my data afterwards? And so you might say, I'm going to look for young and old, and I'm going to look for men and women. You, you, you lay out the things you're going to do, but what you're not allowed to do is come afterwards to the FDA and say, oh, this works really well for 70 to 75-year-old men with this pre-existing condition. That's not admissible. Why? Well, of course, if you have lots of covariates, we all know if there's like 10 people with great outcomes, I can find something that they have in common. And then post hoc, I can say, oh, these are the people it should be approved for. And that would be spurious. And that's another way of saying p-value hacking. Um, data mining, the bad version of data mining, not don't do it. So uh, what, but what, we would, what people who are familiar with machine learning would know is that, in fact, you know, we, can, we have systematic methods, right? I'm going to have an algorithm that looks. I'm not just going to cheat, but I, if I can algorithmically search my data, there must be a way for me to produce valid, acceptable results to the FDA. So, that, so this would be my goal. Um, so the, oops, I, I uh, well, Sorry, I repeated some of this already. What I want to show here is I, we talked before about the, the counterfactual outcomes. Tau I is an individual treatment effect. It's the potential outcome if you got the drug minus your potential outcome if you didn't get the drug. And I can define that in an individual level even though I can never observe it. So what we're going to be interested in for heterogeneous treatment effects is the conditional average treatment effect, which is the expectation of your treatment given your covariates. So I'm going to take Chris, and I'm going to take your age, and your gender, and your background, and then I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to figure that you have your own expected treatment effect on the basis of that. That's the conditional average treatment effect. So some of the specific open issues I want to highlight are, um, if my goal is to estimate a treatment effect, how might I re-optimize machine learning methods for the goal of causal inference um, rather than prediction? And there's really going to be, I think, sort of two distinctions, and I'll, I'll, I'll push on both of them. 
The first is that it's, your criterion is different. So if I have a, if I, you, as we all know, if you change the objective function for an algorithm, it's going to change what it does. And if you have a limited amount of data, you're going to go as far as you can in the direction you told the algorithm. So you shouldn't tell it to go in the wrong direction. You should tell it to go in the right direction. If the right direction is I want to find x's that give different treatment effects, I shouldn't ask it to find x's that help me predict outcomes differently. So if you think about it, like, you know, there might be lots of things that affect your level of income, like your parents' income and so on, and I might be able to predict your income really well, but a particular training program, the di dimensions that explain the heterogeneity of the training program might be very different than the things that explain the level of your income. So to the extent that they're aligned, it won't really matter, but they could be quite different. Okay? Um, and then the second thing is that we're going to want to get standard errors out the other side. The FDA is very worried about sampling variation. So you can't just have an algorithm and say, oh, I did a bias variance trade-off. No, they want an unbiased estimate of a treatment effect and a confidence interval around it. And for that matter, so does Bing. The A-B testing platform on Bing won't even show the point estimate of your result unless it's statistically significant. They do not want spurious things. Uh, they want things that have statistical confidence. And so, but to get a confidence interval, you actually can't have a bias variance trade-off. You, you need to have an unbiased estimate. You need, to, you need to make sure that your confidence interval is going to be centered around your estimate. So that's going to mean that I want to change the criterion a bit for what, how, what I ask my models to do. But of course, we have decades of experience in machine learning on making good algorithms. So I don't want to throw out everything we've learned about how well random forests work or other things work. I just want to tell them to do something a little bit different. Okay? And so I'd say the, the, the people that, uh, that's most closely related to what I'm talking about is actually a group at MSR New York and, and their various co-authors and a, a community around contextual bandits and online learning, which is also trying to estimate optimal policies and get um, causal effects. So they're uh, you know, fairly close and, and embracing a lot of these same kinds of concepts. Um, what I say one difference is that I'm focusing on inference and standard errors, which has been less of a focus uh, there. Um, okay, so the importance of inference, we need a p-value. If you want to publish an economics paper, you need a p-value. Uh, you need a confidence interval if you want to get a drug approved, you need to. But in addition, there's a little bit, something a little bit deeper here. In the prediction context, um, mean squared error on a test set is like the gold standard. You know, I don't care what the asymptotic theory of my estimator is. Maybe those assumptions aren't satisfied. Maybe I don't have enough data. So the, the mean squared error in the test set is going to tell me how well my model did at predicting Ys. So why, what, what's the, who cares about the theory? But if I'm estimating a causal parameter for which I have no ground truth, I do not know the ground truth for what the treatment effect is for 60-year-old men. I don't know what the elasticity of demand is for, for staples in, in New York. You know, then I've got, um, I have no way to know whether my model is actually performing well. And so statistical theory has just got to play a more important role in that setting because I just won't know if I got it right. So we have two papers, and I used to think of them as competitors, and now I think of them as just different. So let me um, kind of give the high level on both of them, and then I'll kind of come in for some details. So the first paper is going to change the question a little bit. It's going to say, what, for which subgroups in the population are there heterogeneous treatment effects? And then for those groups, I'm going to give you an estimate and a confidence interval around it. So this is a little bit subtle. So let me just kind of uh, highlight. Suppose that I, d I said uh, men, women, young, old in this room. That's, that's, so suppose the data told me those were the subgroups. Then I could estimate a treatment effect for each of you. Suppose I sprinkled aspirin around you or sprinkled coffee and then I measured your alertness, right? I could figure out what the treatment effect of coffee is uh, for, for, old, for these four cells in this room. Um, th and then I could give you an unbiased estimate of those treatment effects in those groups as well as confidence intervals. Now, for, if you were like on the border of young and old, this would not be an unbiased estimate for you. It would only be an unbiased estimate for the group. Okay? So that's the sense of I'm changing the question. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to give you an unbiased estimate and I'm going to give you a p-value and a standard error, but I change the question. I'm only doing it for a group. I'm not doing it for an individual. For an individual, if I told you that you're 40 years old and that was my dividing line, then for a 40-year-old, surely your prediction is not centered on the truth for you. Okay? 
So um, why is this useful? You could build it into an A-B testing platform and trigger the, 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 the algorithm only for a group, or you could have a drug approved only for a group. If you had a doctor, you can imagine the doctor has a poster on the wall, and it's going to be a decision tree to tell you how to uh, allocate the drug. Okay? So that's, a, that's a, a, a context where you would want subgroups. The, um, the weakness uh, is, oh, I'm sorry, and then the strength of this is that they're actually, I'm not going to require any assumptions about the number of covariates. So basically there is actually no kind of current competitor in this environment of a statistical model that will give heterogeneous treatment effects if you have 1,000 covariates and 200 observations. Um, and the only way I'm able to tell you that I can give you valid confidence intervals with nominal coverage with a really wide data set is that I change the question just as you get, I'm, I'm not going to, if I add more covariates, I'm going to keep the number of groups small. And so my, the number of groups small, the groups big, and I'm still going to get a valid result. Um, a weakness of this, these methods is going to be, it's, they're going to be based on um, uh, something we call honesty. So honesty is going to be a way to make sure that I've got unbiased estimates. I'm going to take half the data to estimate my subgroups and the other half of the data to make my predictions. And so by doing that, I'm going to make sure that the fact that I peeked at my data and did my data mining doesn't bias my predictions. So that's the good side. That's how I'm going to get valid confidence intervals and, and, and very clean predictions. But the, the disadvantage of that is that how I do my splitting is kind of random. And we know that things like CART, which I'm going to build it on, are kind of unstable. And so my subgroups are actually going to be unstable. So you might do, run this three times, and you would get different subgroups. They may all be right. It's not that one's wrong and one's right. They're just different, and that's uh, maybe a bit problematic. The alternative is to uh, get a personalized prediction. And if you wanted to choose a doctor, I wouldn't want the one with the tree on the wall. I'd want the one with the computer-aided decision thing that gave a personalized prediction for me. So personalized predictions uh, would, would be better in principle. And so what we're going to do is build random forests where the base learner trees are these honest causal trees. Honest in the sense that I'm going to take one sample to build a tree and another subsample to estimate them. And so each one of them is going to be unbiased. And so what we're going to show, this is the first um, asymptotic theory for random forest. We're going to show that the regular prediction random forest as well as the causal version are asymptotically normal. We have a, 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 an estimator for the variance so that you can estimate confidence intervals. So that you could use random forest for you know, an FDA trial in principle. Um, so it's useful to be personalized. Uh, the problem is that this is a fully non-parametric method, and now I've got to deal with the laws of statistics, which basically say that, you know, if I have 1,000 observations and 1,000 covariates, there's no possible way I can estimate a fully non-parametric model. So the model will work well, if, but if you have it, the, the coverage of the confidence intervals will start to fall apart as you add more covariates, which it must. I mean, there's no way out of that. There's sort of a, an upper bound for how good this can be. Okay, so those are the, the basic, like those are the two papers um, that, that kind of are pair together. And you, for the details, they're both on archive. You can take a look. The first one's coming out in PNAS, um, and the second one's under review. So now I'll, t I'll spend my remaining kind of giving you a little bit more of the details about this and also kind of a flavor for the research directions. So if you think about uh, CART or regression trees, um, we all know that's a way of partitioning the data. You're going to look through the data and try to find uh, subgroups and partitions, and you'll make predictions by taking an average within the group. The things that, that you ask CART to do is you ask it to, um, to split using a mean squared error, and you use cross-validation to select the complexity penalty. So just putting that in, a, in like algebra, we can think of some of the components of the tree. What do we do within a leaf? We estimate a mean outcome within a leaf. What do we do um, in terms of uh, doing cross-validation? We use mean squared error. Um, and then for assessing out of sample fit, we use mean squared error. Okay? So that's what you're telling the model to do. I want to tell the model to do something a little bit different. I'm going to say within a leaf, I'm going to estimate treatment effects. Um, and then when I think about what my goal is, my goal is going to be a mean squared error of treatment effects. But this is infeasible. I don't know tau i. And so I don't observe the ground truth. 
And so one of the problems then that, that we would pose, and we have an, a first answer to this, but I don't want to say that we have the final word on it at all, is we got to estimate that criterion function. So that's a first thing. We don't know the ground truth. And then I think you get to a trade-off, basically, where on the one hand, I might know my ground truth about outcomes, and so maybe I should train my model on outcomes, but I might use my degrees of freedom in a very inefficient way because things that affect outcome heterogeneity aren't things that affect treatment effect heterogeneity. On the other hand, I, there's this thing I want to, to, to use as my target, but I don't observe it. If I estimate it, I'm going to create noise in my target and I might be trying to go in the right direction, but just be noisy because I can't actually tell if I'm going in the right direction. So there's going to be more of a fundamental trade-off in your criterion function in this case. A second thing, um, and actually we didn't emphasize this in the first version of the paper because we were trying to stay closer to CART, but then I realized this actually both simplified things and was kind of interesting, is that if you anticipate that we're going to do honest estimation, so that is if we anticipate that we're going to to take the, estimate a tr uh, the partition on one part and then re-estimate the treatment effects on another sample, then that also should change the criterion. When you do cross-validation on uh, regression trees, you're trying to eliminate overfitting. You're worried that you're going to put guys together that had really high epsilons and make an extreme prediction for them. But I know I'm going to correct that. I'm not going to use that prediction. I'm going to go to a second independent sample and re-estimate. So I know I'm going to get an unbiased prediction. So my CART predictions are not biased. I don't have a bias. Think about how deep my tree is. On the other hand, I'm going to anticipate that I'm going to re-estimate this tau hat is now going to depend on the estimation sample SE, which is a random variable. And I'm anticipating that I'm going to re-estimate on a new sample. That means I should worry if my leaves are too small that when I re-estimate, I'm going to get a noisy estimate. It'll be unbiased, but it'll be noisy. So I should not make my leaves too small because I'm worried about that noise. So we, we, can ju we just do a little bit of algebra and we can say, all right, we have this, this um, objective function, which is mean squared error on a test set of the treatment effect. Tau i squared, it, that would be hard to estimate, but luckily that's a constant. If I compare two models, tau i squared is a constant in both mean squared errors, so I'm just going to throw that away. Good, because I couldn't estimate it anyways. And then I'm going to focus instead on the tau i times tau hat terms and the tau hat square terms. And with a little bit of algebra, you can rewrite this, this expectation as the expectation of tau hat squared, which is just saying that if you have an unbiased estimator, it's, it's more predictive if it's more variable, kind of like a Gini uh, score, minus two times the variance. I'm going to penalize things that are highly variable because the leaps are small. And I'm also going to reward incorporating x's into my model that help reduce the variance of x, so there, of, 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 of the treatment effect, I'm sorry. So if there's some x that actually is really predictive of outcomes, even if it's not predictive of treatment effects, I'm going to still put it in, not because it predicts treatment effects, that's this term, but because it reduces the variance of my estimate and will give me a more precise estimate. So we use this very different criterion. Again, it's, it's modified for honesty, and it's modified as because it's an estimate of this infeasible treatment effect mean squared error in our trees. And so this is a different objective function, um, and so we get different answers. And so some things you could compare it to, like you could compare it to just trying to, say, take the treatment group and control group separately and estimate trees for them, for example. That would be a more standard machine learning thing, and a, number, a couple of people have proposed that. Um, so the, the, sometimes there are, there are polar cases where that will work better. Um, then there's a lot of cases where this will work better. And so to, remaining to be worked out is just how do we know what the best method is given that there are these uh, trade-offs. Let me now just take a, I had an application to search, but I'll skip that. Let me just show you real quick uh, what, uh, what Stefan Wager, he's a PhD student, just got his uh, PhD at Stanford, um, did with uh, random forests. So we can think of, for personalized predictions, one benchmark is the k-nearest neighbor matching estimator, where if I want to predict for you, I'm going to look at the people similar to you that are treated, the people similar to you that are controlled, and take the difference. Um, we could also do something simple with a kernel estimator. The point is to think about, um, we're going to take people close by you and see what the difference is. The problem is, if you have 20 dimensions, people nearby you in 20 dimensions aren't particularly nearby you in any way. Random forests are a very popular algorithm, and you can sort of think about them as being similar to k-nearest neighbor, but smarter. So if you think about...
Kane, your neighbor, you're just kind of taking, a, I don't know how, I'm just going to just be close to you generally. While if you thought about random forest, I'm going to make predictions ba about you based on who's in a nearby leaf. And we're going to pick which of 20 dimensions are important to do your partition for. Now, so this obviously seems smarter. This isn't a brand new idea in 2016 that it's smarter than a k-nearest neighbor. Why did people use the k-nearest neighbor in practice? Because there was statistical theory about it. Because we knew under some conditions it was asymptotically normal. It just performs like hell if you have five covariates or more. But it, it, in principle, the theory is, is there. And the theory was not there for the random forest. So, you know, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a forest out of these causal trees, just like Bremen does. Um, and we're going to, uh, to make those the forest. So what, just to see how they compare, if you, had, um, if you had this is the true effect in two dimensions, and there's four other irrelevant dimensions, we're able to pick up that true effect while a KNN is going to smear it. Um, if you go to 20 dimensions, K and N is just going to completely smear that because you're trying to be close in 20 dimensions and a bunch of them are irrelevant, while well, our method will still do well. We get a little too sharp around the boundaries because we're using these partitions, these strict partitions, but we basically can preserve the shape. We basically can keep figuring out that only two dimensions are important even if you throw another 20 at it. And in terms of mean squared error, with, with, by, we've got basically 20 times better mean squared error uh, than K and N, which is a lot. Um, so we, we applied this method to the generalized sur survey, so this is kind of uh, poignant in today's political environment. Uh, they do a big survey and they randomize the questions. Some people got asked, are we spending too much or too little on welfare? Other people were asked, are we spending too much or too little on assistance to the poor? And what you find is that there's huge heterogeneity of treatment effects um, and there's also inter some interaction effects. if you're if you're rich and conservative, then you like giving money to the poor, but you hate welfare. Um, and if you're a poor and liberal, then uh, you can, you'll either support welfare or, um, or assistance to the poor. And so essentially, let me just uh, skip to the, the main uh, conclusion, which you can, if you're curious, you can read about. Uh, the, the theory of the paper and the heart of the paper is about proving uh, that you get asymptotic normality of random forests and that you can get a, a, a consistent estimator of the variance. And so we basically rely very heavily on this honesty, the fact that we're going to do this double, double sample splitting. We're going to use some data to build trees and other data to do estimates. Without that, um, the, the, the asymptotically you're going to be bias dominated. The bias doesn't go to zero fast enough. So that modification was very important. Um, one nice thing about the random forest, though, is that you're gonna, you can keep subsampling, so you're going to subsample thousands of times, so all of the data is going to get used, and there's really not a lot of cost of doing the double sampling because you were going to subsample anyways. Um, and so it's really for free that you get this, this honesty and less bias, and in fact it can perform, not always, but it can often just beat uh, a regular random forest um, uh, for that reason. So just to then uh, conclude, the, the ideas here are that you know, we have these incredibly good machine learning methods that are, have all of these strengths, but we're, if you take them just off the shelf, you're asking them to do something a little bit different than you would want to do for causal inference. You could just take them off the shelf and have them optimize a slightly wrong thing and you would get okay answers and in fact sometimes better answers but in many cases you can make them perform even better for the task at hand if you actually customize them for the task at hand which is kind of tautological uh, but then I've also raised that I have some particular ways to deal with the problems created but I, I would expect that there would be better ways developed over time and, and we would learn a lot more about how to balance the trade-offs um, between kind of going for the thing you, you, the ideal goal that you don't know and the non-ideal goal that you do know.